morning, everyone. Good morning. He's worthy of our worship and praise this morning. Amen. 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 It's great to be back in God's house and great to see each of you here today. I'd like to welcome everyone to our worship service. And uh, we are looking forward to a wonderful worship service here today. Amen. 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 I mean, I hope each of you have came today with expectation, okay, because we serve an awesome God that loves us and desires a relationship with us through his son, Jesus Christ. And it's offered to every one of us. And if you've never experienced that today, then today can be the day of salvation for you. Amen? Amen. Uh, I would like to say that uh, I love the Lord this morning. Amen? And uh, uh, it's Veterans Day this past week, and, and in a few moments we'll be honoring our veterans. And I just want to say thank you personally from me to you for your service for our country. And I have some scripture I'd like to read for you today. It's out of the book of Proverbs, chapter 11, verses 30 and 31. It says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. If the righteous will be recompensed on the earth, how much more the ungodly and the sinner. So let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, God, we do thank you for this day. Thank you for the privilege of being in your house today, God, that we can come together here and lift you up and worship you, God, because you are worthy. And we praise you today for who you are in our lives, God, and for, and for making a way for each of us to have eternal life and a personal relationship with you through Jesus. God, we love you and thank you for all you're doing in our, in our lives and in the lives around the world, God, that you're drawing people to you. And we thank you for that. God, today, just have your way in us today, and, and, and God, we just praise you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Carol. For Bethesda Seniors, uh, begin at 1130. If you've not signed up uh, in your Sunday school class, there's a registration form out on the front table out there. Uh, you don't have to be signed up to, or registered to come, but it just helps us kind of know how many to expect for meals. We'll have some extra. So if you find a friend or family member or neighbor that's a senior that uh, you can invite and bring them, do so. Don't hold back just because you name it on a sign-up sheet somewhere. But if you would, if you'll let us know, you're going to be here. Also, you can call my wife Peggy Colbert or call Sarah Heath and uh, add your name to that registration list, and we'll be glad to have you. Also, if you've got a favorite table game, you can bring it. Uh, we're going to have a couple of table games we'll bring. Uh, you don't have to play a game to come either. If you just want to sit and talk and fellowship, you can do that. You won't be pressed to learn a new game. I know that increases stress for some folks. <laughs> we're just looking forward to a good time of fun and fellowship and food. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Many of the countries that we're working in, they're very hostile to the gospel. They're very dangerous places where these children are growing up. A shoebox gift can really be light in a dark place. Generally, uh, Operation Christmas Child is seen as a, as a fun, lighthearted project, but there's a whole other side of what we're doing. We go into places where a person can lose their life if you tell them about the Lord Jesus Christ. Thousands of Christians are forced to flee again, facing imminent execution. There were a number of civilian casualties. We're working with local believers who uh, face incredible opposition on a, on a daily basis. Many of our believers, our friends who follow Christ, are faced constantly uh, by interrogation, by secret police, investigation, uh, burning the churches down, uh, persecuting, even, even to the extent of death. I mean, everything is, um, is kind of discreet and hidden. It is dangerous, but God has given us ways 
One of the ways is these shoe boxes. The believers are literally putting their lives on the line to share the gospel with the next generation, and we want to be able to help them do that through the power of a, of a simple shoebox gift. I have seen these boxes go into areas of the world where there's been war, and years later, I've had people come to me and say, I was a kid and you gave a box and it changed my life. It gave me hope. Thank you, thank you. Very good. In the midst of the, the challenges that these local believers are facing, we are seeing the church grow. And so uh, we want to continue to fan that flame, continue to have the opportunity to share the love of Christ. Pray for these boxes as they go to countries around the world. We need your help. Don't back off. We need your help. We need it now. What if what mattered most to you had to be a secret? We're in the home stretch on our Operation Christmas Child shoe boxes, and they were coming in today in uh, long uh, lines, bringing them in. And so we know we have some Sunday school classes still finishing up this morning. Even while we speak, I know we have one class over there packing lots of boxes, and so some of you have not gotten yours finally in. We announced last week that our deadline will extend all the way to next Sunday. Uh, it previous been previously been announced uh, this week, but we are the collection center, so that gives us a little bit of grace as far as getting your boxes in, and you know that many of you have signed up to be a part of Operation Christmas Child Collection Week, and if you say, well, I thought I'd be busy, but I'm not, if you'll see Sister Marty or Brother Brian, They'll get you on the schedule, and we can never have too much help. It'll be a great time of fun and fellowship as we serve, serve the Lord. And uh, it's been exciting for me. I mentioned lots of times that as the pastor, I get to receive a lot of good news on behalf of the church that maybe everybody doesn't hear. This week alone, I got about half a dozen phone calls from people at other churches just wanting to confirm we were their drop-off location when we would be here and that just puts a sense of excitement in my heart for what's coming uh, this coming week and what God's going to do with that. So uh, let's get excited about bringing and finishing our giving, but also we're going to get to touch the giving of a lot of other people, and we get to be in that privileged position. So help out if you can and pray for those boxes as they go around the world. I want to pause this morning in our service and say thank you to our veterans. Uh, the way Veterans Day falls on a, on a day of the month, it doesn't always fall close to a to a Sunday, and it kind of fell about as far away from a Sunday as it could, and so it's kind of hard to know should we focus on it last week or this week. Well, today we want to just say thank you to our veterans. It was very powerful on my mind as a few weeks ago I was at the Cowboy Church in the Jerusalem community, and we worshiped with them, and I've mentioned that to you, but as we were leaving, uh, Sister Rebecca Hampton, that is our missionary there, she came up to me and, and asked something, and the Bible says we have not because we ask not. And if we ask for something we don't get it, we're asking for the wrong things. Well, Sister Rebecca is great at asking the Lord for what she needs and, and truly needs. And, and she said, I've been praying about it. I want to ask you a difficult and a strange question. I said, well, what's that? She said, don't you have cows? I said, yes. She said, do you have a trailer that you haul your cows in? I said, yes. She said, do you have one that will hold nine horses? I said, I have no idea if my trailer will hold nine horses because I've never hauled horses. She said, would you be willing to haul some, some horses for us on Veterans Day to the parade in Jasper? I said, we will be here. And so on Veterans Day, we pulled our trailer up there. And, and I can tell you now that it will not hold nine horses. Uh, it'll hold seven or uh, probably two dozen Shetland ponies. But they didn't have that many Shetland ponies. So we loaded up seven horses and went to the, the Jasper Veterans Day parade. Had a great time. And also, as the pastor I mentioned one of the good things. One of the things that sometimes can be a negative is a lot of things we're doing, uh, and I'm on the front lines. Not that some a negative, but you just get hit with all the questions, and everybody's looking to you. When I was at the parade in Jasper, everybody thought I had my well, I had my cowboy hat on, had my boots on, and I'd probably stepped in some stuff along the way. Nobody thought I knew anything about anything, and I was glad. So I just kind of blended in the background, and I just watched while everybody thought that these young ladies and guys on horseback. Uh, knew everything about everything, and people would just come up, barriers broken down, and talking to them about military service and veterans, but also want to know why they do what they do. And that just opened a glorious door for them to share Jesus with people. 
And so I just got to step back in the background, kind of camouflaged in my cowboy boots, and, and see people talking about Jesus, about some great stuff. So I think even Veterans Day is a very special day, and I just praise the Lord for a Christian ministry that redeems that time for the Lord to share the gospel. Today, we want to redeem the time and say thank you to our veterans. So if you are a veteran, if you've served in any branch of the armed forces, We'd like for you this time to stand to your feet or raise your hand high or whatever because we want to recognize you. And I know when, Mike, you can stand up. You stand up over there, okay? If we're going to, you don't have to give name, rank, and serial number, but do tell your name and, and what branch of the service at least you are in because our church is large enough that not everybody knows everybody and sometimes we forget and it's important. So we're going to start over here, Brother Bill. I'm Bill Plants and I was in the United States Army. Amen. Thank you, Bill. Michael Langston, United States Army. Okay. Uh, I'm sorry, John. Yeah, yeah um, <laughs> I was in the Marine Corps. All right. Tell them who you are. Oh, I'm John. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> He's got a last name, Jonathan yeah, yeah. Parker. All right. Brother Aaron, you're not standing up, but I'm going to You were in early service. I, I know. You twice honored, brother. They were paid in the U.S. Army and retired. Okay. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes, U.S. Army. U.S. Army. All right, Jess Regan. All right, Mr. Fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> he was codenamed Mr. Fantastic. Did I miss anybody else? I know we have many more, not in this service uh, of, of the church right now, but uh, serving different places, and I'm not going to start trying to name them or I'll forget some and dishonor the others. But thank you all for your service. It's because of the kinds of things that you did and the service and time you put in that allows us to be able to serve the Lord with freedom in this country for which we are very privileged and thankful to you. So let's give all these men uh, and women thank you.
Um, I always treasured you guys who have fought, but uh, I'm part of Quilts of Valor, and um, now it's just a, a totally different, awesome meaning. So if you are a veteran and you can go on Quilts of Valor and you can register for a quilt, it's free. doesn't cost you anything. We will be honoring uh, Vernon Jackson the 28th of this month. So we would love to do that for you. Good morning, church. Good to see everybody this morning. Uh, we're going to be singing a song that we've been personally singing out here for probably, I don't know, 18, 20 years. But I hope that somebody's singing it long after we're gone if the Lord tarries is coming. Uh, it's a song that reminds us that no matter what time or season we find ourselves in, uh, we do have things that we can be thankful for. Uh, just pray for us as we sing. Thank you, Lord, for your blessings on me. Don't you love Thanksgiving season, amen? Time to be able to focus our attention and our efforts on praising the Lord for all the things that he's done in our life and what he's doing through our life. And Thanksgiving ought to be more than just one season, one week. It ought to be the theme of every day of our life. It is a great opportunity to focus, though, during a few days. And I know we are leading up now very quickly to the week of Thanksgiving. 
One of the things that is a hallmark in our church of the week of Thanksgiving traditionally, going back over 30 years, is our participation in our community Thanksgiving service. And last year, for the first time in literally 30 plus years, uh, we did not participate because we did not have our community Thanksgiving service. And so it's been on the calendar for a couple months, but even as recently as last week, it was not definitely a go. We had all the COVID kickback, I guess, eight weeks ago, 12 weeks ago. There was a surge going on, and we just weren't sure about it. And I just kept praying, Lord, what do you, would you have me do? And I thought, well, we can just ask. We can ask the other pastors what they think, and with some fear, because it's kind of one thing to navigate through COVID troublesome waters in this church, but then to ask other churches to do or not do things can can be a little worrisome, I guess, just being honest. But to a to a person that I called, every church in the community that traditionally uh, would participate, every pastor was expecting the phone call. So I was hoping we were going to have it. I'm so excited. And so I'm excited today to remind you to put on your calendars, Tuesday, the week of Thanksgiving, at 7 o'clock, we're going to be at World Harvest Church uh, and First Fruits Ministry there with Pastor Rusty Harridan. And uh, some of you remember the last time we had Community Thanksgiving, Pastor Rusty preached here. Uh, he's going to be hosting. It's a good large facility where people can spread out in there and uh, have all the room that you, you need. Uh, Brother Guy Gaynor, the pastor at Pine Grove Missionary Baptist Church, is going to be bringing the message. And so we're looking forward to that. In addition to those churches, Pleasant Valley will be involved. Uh, Brother Keith Gibson there, Pleasant Hill, uh, Brother David Peeler. Uh, Mount Pleasant Methodist Church. We got a lot of Pleasants in this community. This is a pleasant community that we're a part of, and all the Pleasants are going to be there. Mount Pleasant Methodist, Pastor Alan Miller, they've all said they will participate. So we're looking forward to that, and uh, I'm looking forward to being at World Harvest with Pastor Rusty because it, since we've been together last in a room worshiping, uh, our church through COVID in connection with his church, we did a lot of food distribution. If you'll remember some Sundays uh, during the quarantines and pandemics where we had trailers out front with boxes of food and you would take some potentially to your own home or to your neighbor and then we would deliver that food in the afternoons. That was through the ministry there at uh, First Fruits and World Harvest and our church has partnered with them and they partner with us as we go to Kentucky. So we've got a lot going on. I'm looking forward to being able to worship with our friends and neighbors in the church. The other thing I want to mention to you is uh, one of the traditions is we'll have finger foods afterwards, and what we prayed and talked about was we're still going to offer that opportunity, and for some of you that may say, we don't feel good about doing finger foods, well, just don't do that, okay? And so you just come worship, and you can go home, uh, but for those that do, we're going to offer that opportunity. There will be a time for finger foods for people to gather into fellowship after the, the regular part of the service. So that is the Tuesday of the week of Thanksgiving, and I don't want to make today about a bunch of announcements, but I felt that that was particularly important because many people have been asking about it, and it is on go, and so we're looking forward to that. Uh, it is a season of Thanksgiving. It's always the season for witnessing, and we've been looking at preaching through the Gospels and preaching through the Gospel of Matthew and preaching specifically over the last few weeks the Great Commission of Jesus, and we're almost through with that. If you're saying, oh, I hope we get to something else. We're going to get to something else. But today we're going to focus on the Great Commission. And in the last final phrase, even to the end of the age. Now, I know we preached a sermon a few weeks ago that talked about our life and what we have with our life. We only have one life to live, and that's it. And that is included into the end of the age. But as I prayed about it, I wanted to be a little more specific today because I think there is a lie of the devil that helps uh, permanently quarantined the church over the last 2,000 years into an attitude of, well, maybe it just doesn't matter, or maybe someone else will do this. But I want to remind us from God's Word today that witnessing must be our priority in life because there is an end that is coming, not just the end of your life, but the end of the age of grace and the end of the age of the church, after which there is not a promise of a hope of salvation for those who would call on Jesus because this is the age that God has given us to preach the gospel. So let's stand to our feet, and many of you could, by now, you have memorized, and many of you can no doubt quote this, but we're going to read it, and if you want to whisper it together while we go through it, maybe you can shut your eyes and you've got it memorized by now. But let's look at Matthew 28, 18, 19, and 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me 
in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for this wonderful congregation of believers today. And thank you for those who have congregated, perhaps with us, who are not yet believers in Jesus. God, we thank you for those that are at home watching through Facebook. And Lord, we thank you for those in our church that continue to make that ministry possible through the internet. And Lord, we thank you for all the ways all over the world that people who aren't in the room with us, who aren't hearing the service that we're a part of, there are those around the world who are called according to your name and purpose on this, your Lord's day, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. God, we ask you to send us from this place as believers with a hope and a resurrected Jesus and eternal life to share your good news with other people. God, we thank you for all the many facets of what the church is a part of. We thank you again for letting us be a part of it. We thank you for a season of thanksgiving that our hearts would be turned toward you and grateful for what you've done and what you are doing and what you will do. God, we thank you for this service, and we pray that if there's one lost here today, they would be saved. And for all those who know you, for us to be focused and prioritized and empowered to go forward with your gospel message. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. And you may be seated. Witnessing is our priority because the end is coming and it's coming quickly. Time is a relative factor. In Jeremiah, this past Wednesday night, we were looking at how there were, were those who were true prophets and false prophets. And in the day of Jeremiah, the true prophet was the one proclaiming that there would be a time of difficulty and a time of judgment. And that time would not be a short time. It would be 70 years. Now, I said it wouldn't be a short time. We polled the audience. We ran, went around the room on Wednesday, and we said, how many people think 70 years is a short amount of time, and how many people think that 70 years is a long time? And let me tell you what the results were. Everybody in the room that was under the age of 25 thought that 70 years was forever. Right, Daniel? Amen. All right. That, that's kind of what... And everybody in the room that was north of like 25, 30, or, or north of there, they thought that 70 years was just a blink of time. Time kind of gets relative. The older we get, <laughs> the longer a longer period of time seems like a shorter period of time. I've been the pastor here now uh, 27 years. And for some of you, you say, boy, that was a long time. <laughs> and, and for some of us, for me, I've been here the whole time. Man, it seems short. Now, some of y'all have been here a long time. You're like, no, it seems long. No, I mean, uh, I, I think that many people throughout life would say this many years of school seems forever when we're in school, 12 years or four years or whatever. High school seems forever. College seems forever. You get through it, wow, what a blink of time. Our life, as it transfers through, we we realize how fleeting it is the longer it goes. The lie of the devil is to convince us that not just our lives, but the succession of lives of the people we know is going to go on and on and on and on. And because of that, maybe there's not a, an intense priority and therefore a lack of prerogative to push with the gospel in the lives of our spouses and our kids and our grandkids and our neighborhood and our church but what we know is is that there really is an end of time and because of what we know about the rest of time the reason the 70 year olds in the group on Wednesday felt like time was short is because they realize that there's an end somewhere out there and by nature of being maybe 60 or 70, most of those guys in that Bible study that I was in would be willing to say to you, because they were all saved, we're, we're looking forward to heaven. But what we realize is we're way closer to it than we used to be. Now, I know, I think that Christians have somewhat of a, a grasp on that as it concerns our lives. And we preached a sermon on that a few weeks ago. But today's sermon, I, I would like to convey, and, and I want you to pray that I can convey, that it's not just in our lifetime, but it is in the age of the church or the age of grace. I often use those terminologies when I preach, and, 
and I do that interchangeably somewhat, that we are in this age now that has been going on for roughly 2,000 years. And when Jesus spoke of this age, and we see in the Bible recorded that this age began, the understanding was that this age will not last a long time. But it will last for a period of time, and it will be over. Now, number one today, I only have three points, by the way, instead of seven. So if you think, man, he's never going to get through, there's three main points. So number one, as we witness as a priority, we can have productive conversations about the age we are currently in and the one that is to come. In the Gospel of Matthew, there is a chapter that begins with basically this phrase, they came to Jesus and asked him some questions. And he said to them, that it is not for you to know everything about all the ages and all that's in the age. But it is for you to realize that there is an age that we're in, and he was talking about the age he was in there, and that there is an age that is to come. And if you read the Gospel of Matthew, these phrases of the age, the age, the end of the age, the age that is to come, is a repetitious phrase and idea, so much so that I think that I can be guilty of preaching and just gloss right through it, and not take enough notice of it, and certainly not take enough time and make you as a congregation aware that we are in an age time in the history of God in the world that has begun and it will end. You say, well, preacher, what are you saying? Well, we we can get lost in this topic, and I don't intend to today, but there are those who have all sorts of different ideas about dispensations of time in the Scripture. It's not my intent to get into all that. But you can go through Scripture, and no matter what your overriding theological belief is about dispensations of time, there were obviously different covenants in the Old Testament. And think about those as as synonymous with an uh, an age of time. There was the the covenant with Adam and the covenant with with Noah, covenant with Abraham. God made a covenant with Moses. God made a covenant with the people of the land concerning the land and whose land it would be. People are still fighting about that, but God made promises to his people about the land. God made a covenant with David, and God ultimately, and you're aware of this, through Jesus Christ, finalized the new covenant through his blood, the covenant that he established through his son Jesus as a final covenant with his people that we can have eternal life. These these different covenants did not collapse on their self, if we think about this that way. These covenants expanded what God was doing and increased what God made aware to people that he was doing. God was doing it all alone. By the way, let me remind you, God's God all by himself. He didn't have to include me in the conference, nor you. He's still God all by himself. But through time, God made himself more known. And the book of Hebrews makes it very clear to us that in the final time, in the final way, Jesus is the final revelation of the fullness of God to this world. And so the, the, the full revelation of God was expanding through time and through Jesus' sinless life, atoning death, victorious resurrection, his sending and his ascension to the Father, sending the Holy Spirit to us to live in the church, began what we would consider the age of grace or the age of of the church and a time frame where there is a gospel that is not limited to a geographic place on earth a demographic or cultural identity of a people or a language group that the gospel has had all the the hindrances peeled away from it so can be perfectly seen and proclaimed around the world to the whosoever wills and so we in this age of grace or the church preach the hope of salvation to all people through Jesus and in him alone. And we've been talking about that. Hopefully we talk about that every time we come to church. But we've been trying to be very specific about it as we preach about the Great Commission. But Jesus says in the Great Commission that there's this power, there's this purpose, but it goes until the end of the age. This age will stop. I may still be alive when this age stops. People are asking Jesus all the time, will we be here? Will it be right now? He says, it's not for you to know the time, but it'll be shortly. So that was 2,000 years ago. If it was shortly 2,000 years ago, how short do you think it is now? It's shortly. It is soon. And so there's nothing that's hindering the Lord from calling an end to the age. So what does it look like? And he told them what it would look like. It would look like in the, the church of God on the earth at the end of the age would be raptured 
out of the church, off the earth, excuse me. There would be a time of, of tribulation that would begin on the earth. There will be a time of judgment of the nations that will take place. There will be a second return of Jesus to set up, I believe, an earthly dominion and reign on this earth. And he will perform these things. And he doesn't need me to vote on it. And he doesn't need, need me to make it happen. All these things are within his power and within his purview to make happen according to his purpose. But here's what we need to hear because people get lost in all that. I can get lost in all that. God tells us these things not for us to become experts on a million trivial ideas. God gives us this understanding of the age in which we're in to give us purpose in our life and the conversations that we are called to have in order to share the gospel of Jesus. Now let me say it this way. Many years ago, one of the young people in the church have, had asked me, Preacher, tell me more about Daniel. And tell me more about Revelation. And let's get into some of the prophecies. And I've got a question about this fiery dragon and shooting fire out of this thing. And, that, and like, tell me all about it. I was like, well, why do you want to know all about all that? It's like, well, I believe the end's coming, don't you, Preacher? Yes, sir, I believe the end's coming. Well, when it does. Some of my friends ain't going to be ready to go. And I was like, yeah, that'd be bad. And he said, and when it does and they're not ready to go, he said, I want them to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was right. Okay, let me get this right. You, you want to have conversations with your friends now. So then a year or two years or ten years and the age ends and the new epoch of time begins you want your friends to think back and say, boy, he was right. Yeah. I said, well, let me explain something to you. All those books of the Bible, the whole Bible itself, Jesus Christ himself did not come, did not inspire men of God to write in times of old the perfect word of God so that you could be proved as right. We are equipped and thoroughly furnished in this way and given this commission so that we can have conversations today with our school friends and with our neighbors and with our spouses and with our kids and our grandkids and everybody we know. We can have those conversations in this age because they need to be saved right now. They don't need to just simply say, boy, he was right. The Bible is not so we can be proved as right. The Bible is given to us so that Jesus can be definitively discussed and proven as being right. Jesus is right. It's not so much important that people see us as right. He says in his words, Jesus himself, the end of the age will come. So we need to be very careful about this easy state of being that we fall into to say, well, you know, he hadn't come back yet. And my Paul Paul was a Christian and his family before him were Christians and they all lived in faith and died having not yet fully received and seen it. So maybe it's just not going to happen. We're still going to believe in Jesus, but maybe it's just going to be a perpetual thing and people can always believe in Jesus. Listen, if we believe in Jesus, believe in what he said, he said, this gospel is for this age and it's for this age only now so I'm going to be with you. I'll never leave you and forsake you, and I will empower this gospel to the end of the age. The apostles received it, and they were saved, and they were baptized, and they taught others to believe and receive and obey. And somewhere down the line through that process, we've received it, and we need to relay it that people must follow, be baptized, believe Jesus, and obey him, and do it now. There are differences in the ages. We're no longer in the age of the law. Jesus fulfilled the law. He completed the, everything necessary for righteousness. He fulfilled the prophetic verses about his life and death and resurrection. And he will fulfill the prophetic verses about his ultimate return and reign. There are different ages and we need to be thankful as we talk to people about the one that we're in and about the one that is to come that this is the one they need to move in now. Because people always, well, if I'm here and the Lord comes back, you know, I, this is what I'll do or that's what I'll do. Listen, some of you saying, you, so you never told the guy about Revelation. Some of y'all are hung on that in your brain. Let me, let me tell you what I finally told the young man about Revelation. Here's Revelation. Time will come to an end. You need to be ready. Because a lot of people won't be ready. And it'll be bad. And then some of you right now are thinking, but, but I'll get ready. 
Everybody that thinks they'll get ready won't. Most everybody that says they'll get ready later, get ready, read about the book of Revelation. They're not ready when he comes back and say, oh, this starts happening. All these things travails on the earth and wrath. And you think everybody will turn to God. No, no, they won't. <laughs> People's hearts get harder and harder and harder in the days that are written about in Revelation. Let me encourage you to, to remember this. This is the day that God gives us to preach the gospel. Have conversations with people. You say, well, people want to ask me about prophecy. And I don't really know how many times people really want to ask you about prophecy. Can I tell you this? I think I could safely say 99.99999% of all questions I've ever had in my whole entire life about prophecy come from church people and not lost people. Honestly. And, and again, mostly church people. And I don't want to encourage you not to care about it. I mean, study it. But, but a lot of times it has to do with nuances and being really smart and being clever and rethinking what somebody else already thought. And that's... That's up to you. You do all that if you want to. But here's the thing. Sometimes lost people really do get concerned about the end of time. And I'm going to make everybody mad who's listening to me right now. If you've been watching the news, <clears throat> over the last two weeks, I think it ended yesterday, we've had a big summit going on in the world, a climate summit. People from, I think, over 100 nations have been there trying to figure out what to do about global warming. I don't care what you think about global warming. I'm just saying 100, 100 nations were there, a whole lot of people, a lot of media coverage. A lot of things they said 10 years ago they were going to do, they hadn't done. Now they're saying they're going to do a bunch more stuff. We'll see if they do, and that'd be fine. But here's, as I was getting ready to preach this sermon about the end of an age, here's what God pricked my heart with. Most of you would say that's a bunch of liberal-minded people, scientists, mathematicians, climatologists, people that don't really believe in the sovereign hand of God, because I hear y'all talk. If they believed in the Lord, they wouldn't be worried about what's melting on the earth because God's got it all in control. Well, here's, here's the news, that I, the way I received it this week. I thought about it a different way. About the most serious-minded people that I know of that think that there's an end of the age coming, they may all be lost and ungodly. I mean, that group of people as a whole seems to be pretty convinced that in the next hundred years, something's going to collapse. And it'll be awful. And the flip side of that is the people, most of the people I know that believe the gospel, believe in Jesus, and say they have a hope in heaven. They don't much act like they believe there's ever going to be an end to any age. The American economy is always going to boom. The stock market's always going to be up. Medicine's always going to have an answer. And military is always going to be able to win as long as they fly the American flag. That's kind of the viewpoint of the modern church in America. So much so that it's weirdly true that the people that many of us would say are lost are the ones that are convinced that the age is going to end. And those that are saved seem pretty sure that the age will go on forever without any severe repercussions. So it don't much matter what we do right now. So now that I made made you mad or woke you up, let's look at point number two. There are different ages. Uh, we know enough to talk to a people about it, so why don't we? We don't because we don't really believe that there's an age that is to come. We're pretty sure this age will last forever. Number two, we can provide confirmation to ourselves and to others that the end of the age is as a significant spiritual marker in our lives as it deals with eternity. That's a big, long, I wasn't satisfied with me in my outline today, by the way. It just, just seemed to not get said what I want to say. When the end of the age comes, it will be a definitive marker on our life and on their life. This time that is to come, the rapture of the church, a tribulation time, a judgment time. People argue about some of the sequences of all those things. It doesn't matter how you argue about that. There will be an end of the age. What I'm telling you is, is what happens at that moment will be ingrained as a final decision in life. And there are always going to be people in the church trying to convince us to not take that very seriously. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, open your Bible to 2 Peter, okay? Because uh, some of you started off asleep and you've only gotten comatose since then. So 2 Peter chapter 3. And Peter's reminding the people why it is he's writing to them. I wrote you one letter, he says, and I'm going to write you another letter. And basically what Peter's letter is, is, is point number two of this sermon today. It really does matter what happens at the end, but people are going to try to 
slip off of it. They're going to try to get to a place where they're not really convinced it really does matter. And there'll be people in the church to want to grab that. It's always going to be all right. Nothing's ever going to go wrong. We'll always be able to recover. We're strong. And again, particularly to us, we're in America, so because we're Americans, we can do it. Here's, here's what he says in 2 Peter 3. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both of which I stir up your pure minds by the way of reminder. He's trying to get them to remember something. That you may be mindful of the words which were spoken by the holy prophets in a different age, and the commandments of us in a different age, and the apostles and our Lord and Savior. Different ages. But remember these things. They're important. Knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days walking according to their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire into the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Hang on just a second. We're going to keep... So what I was saying earlier, you say, well, yeah, that's right. Those people meeting a hundred nations, they're wrong. They think we're all going to flood. And you say, okay, yeah, we've already flooded one time. So your only difference in where they are and where you ought to be is the second time it's going to happen by fire, Okay. But it is going to happen. There will be an end of time. And we should be more concerned. Whether or not it's about the climate, we ought to take care of this world. God gave us dominion over it, certainly. But we need to be concerned, and a reality ought to be true for us, is that we as God's people understand there is a calamity that's coming, not by water, but by fire, according to God's word. But beloved, do not forget this one thing, verse 8, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. Now, again, that's not meant to get you to be callous about the fact that it hasn't happened yet. That's meant to make you be careful about the fact that because it hasn't happened yet, you believe it will not happen. Because that's what they were saying. It hadn't happened yet. It's not going to happen. He says, oh, be careful. You don't understand how God keeps time. And God's timetable may be expiring in this very moment. The Lord is not slack concerning his promises, as some count slackness, but is, but is long-suffering toward us. Catch this. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will all be burned up. Verse 11, therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and righteousness? Looking for and hastening the coming of the day of the Lord, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat. Verse 13, nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth in which righteousness dwells therefore beloved stand firm in these things being diligent to be found by him in peace without spot and blameless and consider that the long suffering of our lord is salvation as also our beloved brother paul according to the wisdom given to him has written to you and also in all the epistles speaking of them and these things in which are some hard things to understand which untaught and unstable people twist to their own destruction as they do also the rest of Scripture. Therefore, beloved, since you know this beforehand, beware, lest you fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked, but grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. Preacher, you just read a lot of Scripture. That's good for us. It's like eating our vegetables and taking our vitamins to know what the bible says to know what errors god knew we'd be prone to make that we think because it hasn't happened it's not going to happen it is going to happen and it is happening now even it has not been fully yet seen 
as we have godly conversations about people, productive conversations, leading them to think about eternity in light of who Jesus is, we can provide confirmation through the scriptures that Jesus was telling the truth. That there is an end of the age. That life definitely is short. Certainly our lives are short, short James 4. Life is like a vapor here yet for a little while and passes away. Hebrews 9, 27, after this, men are appointed to die, and after that, the judgment. So yes, we know our lives are short, but even the age of grace in the church we're in will not last forever, but yet the church acts like it will. What are we supposed to do? Act like it won't? What we're supposed to do is get serious about the fact that this is our opportunity to tell other people that they need to know Jesus, because after this, they may not have such an opportunity we can provide confirmation that people need they do have questions in the world oftentimes we're busy thinking in a plane in the church and a level that does not open ourselves up to even hear the concern that people have about eternity people have always according to second peter desired to discount the reality and the ramifications of the end of the age. He said people in the church are going to do it. False preachers and false teachers are going to want to get you to diminish what's going on in your life and their life. But don't fall for that fool's gold because the ages that we are in, the age we are in now is the final age of grace. We cannot discount the ramifications in the lives of others. We need to make sure they know. Make sure they hear. Make sure they understand. Number three, so we can participate confidently. You can get involved in a way where you can find confidence. You say, well, I don't know all that stuff about Revelation. I don't know all that stuff about Daniel. I don't know everything about Jeremiah. Well, here's what I know. If you get in church, if you get in Bible study, if you get in the prayer groups, you'll know more about Jeremiah over time. I'm learning so much. We're teaching through Jeremiah. I'm learning. I'm connecting dots in the New Testament. It's so encouraging. I'm remembering things that I used to know and forgot. The more we study, the more confidence we have. But I don't even want to hold that up as the final bar. What I want you to know is, is if you will just be who God's called you to be, you will end up studying, and you will know things that, that God will put in there. And I really believe in that. I've sat with people before in situations where I knew they were saying things that, that the only way they knew it is the Holy Spirit was whispering it to them as they were saying it. God was giving them the knowledge they needed for the moment in which they were in. And we can participate confidently, knowing that the promise to the New Testament church and the Great Commission is that he will be there. He will never leave us. And as long as this grace age, church age is here, we can preach the gospel knowing that Jesus is doing it, much more so than we are doing it. We can participate confidently in witnessing because of the blessings of belonging in the group. I shared with you about going with the Cowboy Church to the Veterans Day Parade. I shared with you about blending in the background. Such a blessing to see a young man, look like he's probably in his 30s, look to be his wife as best I could tell. They missed the parade. They missed the ceremony. But just hanging around, we were waiting to load up after everybody left. And this guy comes up and he says, was there a parade today? Yes. Was there a ceremony today? Yes. Well, I hate I missed it. He said, I served. He had just on baggy breeches on, like warm-up pants and a camouflage shirt, and he just begins to talk. And as they begin to talk, his, his life began to unfold. And again, I remember, I'm just in the background. I'm just listening to other people, led of the Holy Spirit. Be and do what you can do, too. Just minister to a man who was going through hurt, and a wife who held this man's hand every day as they just kind of began to melt emotionally in front of these people. And they just shared Jesus with them. And as it went on, they said, we already believe in Jesus. We know him. We have a relationship with him. But, but we need some people that can care about us. And there's something about that ministry. And I know that's part of what they aim to do is through the horses and the animals and breaking through people's emotions. There's just something about a horse. Amen. People love horses. And, and it just helps. And they're like, you come up and you ride with us on Friday or you spend a Saturday with us in worship. And, and you can just see God working through this situation because somebody was willing to talk about Jesus with somebody else. Now, I don't know what God's putting in your life. I don't know what tool or what circumstance God gives you to break down barriers. But what I know is he does. He opens those doors for those gospel conversations. And we need to understand there's great blessings for us and for others if we will allow God to open us up in that circumstance to have 
those conversations. And sometimes it's very simple. Well, let me just go back. Most all the times it's actually very simple. Yesterday was the seventh Saturday in the cycle of Saturdays that brings about Go Ministries for our church. And so I had, uh, because of scheduling issues and things that were going on, I had missed the last one or two of those. I can't remember, but I had missed some. Preacher missed. Yeah, everybody has things going on. Everybody misses stuff. But I was able to be a part of this one. And so we packed up the lunches and we got in our cars and we went to, we were at Hill House is where I was, community. And they were dividing up teams. And I had the choice between Gavin or uh, the other little boy, my name just went blank. Trenton, Trenton. Kept wanting to call him Trent all day yesterday. Gavin or Trenton. And uh, I was I was going to have Trenton, and then I looked over there, and Joey and Amy, uh, Joe, not Joey and Amy, Joey and Abby were there, and I thought, well, Joey gets to enjoy his daughter's company all the time, and I'm just the old preacher, and I never uh, get to enjoy being in a youth group or anything like that. I said, well, can Abby walk with me down through here? And he said, oh, yeah. I said, okay, Joey, you get Trenton, I get Abby, and I got the best part of that trade. I just told Trenton that, too. So, so Abby and I are walking right down on... Uh, 53 spur across the end zone of the football field where state championships are won and, and heroes are made. But you know what? I was having better time on the end I was on, on the side of the road I was on, than they've ever had over in that stadium. And I'm not picking fun at Calhoun. I'm just saying there are things that go on in the kingdom that are way better than winning state championships and signing college professional ball scholarships. Because we knocked on the door and handed out some groceries, and we knocked on another door. And a lady opened the door, and we asked her if we could pray for her. And she just began to melt. I didn't even have a horse with me, and she was just melting down. I mean, it's amazing. We weren't in a parade. There were just two of us, and she just had these needs and wanted us to pray for her and wanted us to pray for her daughter. Bad circumstances in all their lives. And Abby shared, and I shared, and we prayed. And you know, the Holy Spirit just spoke to me, said, Preacher, you're about to get out of here and you're going to be a terrible witness because you hadn't really asked her the most important questions of life. You're going to be a bad witness to her, you're going to be a bad witness for me, and you're going to be a bad witness to Abby about what it really means to be a Christian. Because let me let you know something, being a Christian does not simply mean we ride our horses in parades. And being a Christian does not simply mean that we boil hot dogs and put them in sacks and hand them out to senior adults. Being a Christian does not just mean that we take prayer requests and pray for people. Being a Christian means that we are called according to the commission of God. Because I knew when I was preaching tomorrow. That the age could come to end tomorrow. Before seven weeks comes again, the Lord can come back. And as we were praying, and I was saying amen, and we were trying to get disengaged, the Holy Spirit was saying, this lady, you don't know where she stands in line of eternity. And I said, ma'am, can I ask you a personal question before you leave? She said, sure. I said, well, you wanted us to pray, and we did, yes. And, and I said, you've been talking about God, and, and we have too, yes. I said, I need to ask you a very specific question. I said, if I ask you today where you stand in a relationship with Jesus Christ as a personal Lord and Savior and its relationship to where you stand in eternity with God, what would you tell me? And here was her response. She said, well, I worship the Lord in my own way. I have my own kind of relationship with God. Now, let me tell you, part of me wanted to say, oh, that's so good, I'm glad to hear it. But the Holy Spirit was like telling me, uh-huh, I told you so. You need to be more specific. And I said, well, I'm glad you said that. I said, but here's, here's what I want to make sure you understand. I want to say it with all politeness and love. I said, the Bible tells us that we've all sinned and all fallen short of the glory of God, and sin separates us from him eternally. But he made provision for our sin, and he sent his only begotten son to live without sin and die in your place and in my place for our sin so that we can place our faith in his grace and be saved forever because that he died and lives again on our behalf. And I said, what I specifically want to say to you, God never gives us the option 
of worshiping him or coming to him in our own way. And I said, I'm not picking on you about how you said that because sometimes people mean the same thing, but we just say it in a, in a way that we don't understand. But I want you to understand that nobody can go to God their own way. You can't and I can't, nor can a Abby or anybody else. I said, so when I just described for you the only way that God has made available for you to come to him, would you tell me you do or do not have that kind of relationship with him? She said, oh, I have that kind of relationship with him. I believe in Jesus. And so she went through the whole thing, and, and she's saved. She was already saved. She said, well, preacher, you just wasted our time. I thought somebody was going to get saved this morning when you told that story. Listen, I'm talking to you about blessing. You, can you, I don't even want to imagine the conviction I'd be going through this morning trying to preach this sermon tell this story if I had to tell you that I didn't ask that woman a specific question or give her a specific understanding of what it meant to know Jesus for eternity past the end of this age. And what I found in that was great blessing because she said with her own lips, she could have lied to me. I don't know. I never know if people are lying to me. But I think she was telling the truth. But she was able to convey in her own lips her own testimony that she had received salvation through Jesus Christ in the way that he has prescribed and provided. And that encouraged me. I found blessing in it. And what I want to encourage you in, so many people say, oh, I'm going to, they're wanting us to witness. He's preaching about it a lot these days, all this witness and stuff. And I just, if I witness, I'm just going to be beat up and cast down and cast out and stomped on. I'm going to feel awful. And I tell you, a lot of times you try to witness for Jesus, you're going to end up feeling great. Because you're going to find out there are some Christians in this world. Now, sometimes you're going to face disappointment. Sometimes you'll face discouragement. But we've always got to have a burden in light of the end of the age. Because the Lord knew what I was preaching today. And the Lord know how, knows how hardened my heart can get. And how commercialized and materialized my mind can be. And, how, and, and I like getting stuff done. I like finishing things. That was our second door. I had a whole bag full of hot dogs getting cold. I could be like the newspaper boy just going out there. Hey, Abby, you knock, I'll throw. We can just throw those things on every doorstep and, and get them before the cats do. But that's not what God sent us there for. So we make it on around, and we're 90% done. And I've shared part of this story with you before, but there's still a lady that lives over in Hill House that we, we saw her, and she was walking down the road. Had a big box and a cane. She's walking to the mailbox. Can you? Can we help you with that? No, sir. I've got it. I said, "You sure?" Yep. She said, "Told a big long story about how she had fallen and broken every toe on one foot and a knee and an ankle and some other things. And was just having a lot of difficulty. But the doctor wants her to walk, and she felt like walking yesterday morning. So she's going from her door to the mailbox. And it had been a few weeks, a few months since I had seen this lady, and she'd been through a hospital stay, so she looked a little different. I said, "Ma'am, you." You are Miss Hayes, the, the lady that grew up at Bethesda. She said, yes. I said, well, I remember the testimony you gave. She said, oh, yeah, I remember Dewey Braden, the pastor there, and his sweet wife. And she talked about his wife way longer than the pastor she talked about and how they ministered to me and how they loved me. And She said, I remember getting saved and baptized there. And I remember praying when I was there because I thought so much of her and her husband that I want to marry a preacher one day. And. I said, yeah, you shared that with me. She said, I'd have married a preacher, and we was married over 40 years, and, and he went home to be with Jesus. I said, yeah, just a few months back. She said, yeah. She said, I miss him so much. I said, yeah, I know you do. She said, but I know where he is, and I know I'm going there. By the way, she may be listening to this worship service of the one from 815 because Miss Hayes is normally on Facebook with us every Sunday. Worshiping Jesus. Started her Christian walk at Bethesda, and near 50 years later, she's still walking with Jesus, and Praise God, but they're still here preaching Jesus, pointing men and women, boys and girls. And, and, and so I was so encouraged because I was getting to meet another Christian who, who was sure, not in just this age she had a hope, but a hope in the age that was to come. We walked a little further and met a, name by a man by the name of Mr. William who'd had a birthday yesterday. He told Abby he was 27 the day before yesterday, and I was pretty sure he had it backwards. I think he was 72, he later admitted. We talked to him, and Abby found out that nobody's saying happy birthday to him on his birthday. And so guess what we did in the name of Jesus? We sang happy birthday to Mr. William. Now, again, we, that's not all we do, but Mr. William, we sing happy birthday, and he's immediately testifying of his love for Jesus and how he knew he was saved, and he had a hope in this age and in the age to come. Now, I'm telling you what, just by getting out and 
walking a little bit. Oh, I can't walk. Listen, it's about as long as walking around a football field one time. Yeah, it's not too far. Knocking on the door, and it was cold, but most of us got a coat and a toboggan. Not having all the answers, not having all the words, but just letting the Holy Spirit remind us when we hadn't said enough words to be specific when we need to. <laughs> sometimes we need to sing happy birthday, sometimes we need to ride a horse, and sometimes we need to throw hot dogs or hand them to them. But we always need to be there truly in the name of Jesus. And so about that time I look up, and here comes Joey Moore. You remember I stole his daughter and gave him Trenton? And some of y'all felt bad when I told that story earlier, but let me tell you about Trenton. Y'all remember Trenton? He got baptized a few weeks ago. Trenton and Con Connor, they got baptized on the same day, and they gave the Lord glory and testimony because Brother Gavin had shared the gospel with them months before. Y'all remember those stories? Well, because I took Abby and Joey took Trenton with him, Trenton and Joey got to leave another lady, lead another lady named Miss Blaylock to know Jesus yesterday. I don't know how long you've been saved, and I don't know how long it's been since you've led somebody to Jesus, but Trenton hasn't been saved that long. And I know he don't have all the answers out of Revelation Daniel, and he might not even be able to spell Nebuchadnezzar, but neither can you. But Trenton was on the front line in the trenches yesterday alongside of a godly deacon who got to share Jesus with a lady who tried to find some hope by putting the Ten Commandments on her wall. But you know what? It's so good when you can tell somebody trying to keep the Ten Commandments. That's great. God gave us those. The law is a tutor for us to come to a point to where we find grace. But the age of the law has been completed because the age of grace is now. Jesus satisfied the law. And this lady had tried to find all kinds of different little ways to satisfy Jesus. But yesterday she found out that Jesus had already satisfied himself. And that while we're yet still sinners, Christ died for us. And a godly deacon and a young man named Trenton were able to stand there on the front lines of the gospel battle and stomp on the devil's face, seeing one more person get saved. And what I want to encourage you with is you can do that too. God's people need to be on the front lines. And you need to never be embarrassed or ashamed and never lose the zeal and excitement of being in a church that believes on being in the front lines of Jesus because the burden is too heavy to bear knowing that this age will come to an end one day. And men and women, boys and girls that do not know Jesus will be lost for all eternity. And we as God's people have the blessing of sharing it with them and celebrating it with those who already know him. And I was speaking with someone just recently who said, you know, I'm in a church. The church that I'm in, we don't, we don't have any outreach, and we don't see any people getting saved. And, and, and what I want to tell you is, praise God for churches that do. This is not about blowing Bethesda up. What I'm saying is God's kingdom is a kingdom that he calls to grow, and his spirit is a spirit that empowers us to preach the gospel of salvation in this age. And we need to not be ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God and the salvation. And so we need to echo it from sea to sea and shore to shore, and we need to do it together in joy and cooperation. And we didn't encourage people in whatever church they're in, wherever they are, to tell other people about Jesus because this age will end. And it's God's calling us to be witnesses all the way till the end. Good news for you is what 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says. Today is a favorable time. I will listen to you. And it is a day of salvation and I will help you. Behold, now is the favorable time of salvation so well i don't know is it thanksgiving yet listen it's always thanksgiving it's always salvation season it's always time to tell people about jesus because today is the day of salvation you can tell i can tell we can all tell people together say so, well is it good enough just to hand out hot dogs and ride horses no we got to tell them about jesus we got to be specific we need to give them an invitation and tell them that they can be saved. And praise God when we do that, we do it faithfully and regularly, God saves people. Amen. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and stand to your feet, and we're going to have a time of invitation. Lord, we ask you in this moment to speak to us. God, we thank you in this moment for giving us time together. And God, we ask you for someone to be saved if that's according to your will today. You know, we know it's not your will that any should perish but all come to know you. And Lord, in this moment right now, there are those who need to be witnessing. 
somebody in their life they need to witness to. God, that you would give them that boldness, that they would ask you for that help to break through that icy exterior and to share your love with their neighbor and friend. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we sing.